following is a presentation of the Women's Football Alliance. It's conference championship weekend, and by tomorrow we will know who's making the final trip on the road to Canton. Welcome to the Road to Canton. I'm your host, Brian Sweeney, the voice of the Women's Football Alliance Pro Division National Championship game. With me, as always, is Alex Westhead, but let's jump right in to the conference championship matchups. After beating the Rocky Mountain Thundercats 22-12 in the first round, the 6-1 New Mexico Banditas are set to host the Division III American Conference Championship. They will face off against the 5-2 Oklahoma Rage, who got here with a 26-8 victory over the Midwest Mountain Lions. For Oklahoma, this is their first conference championship, and for New Mexico, it will be their second straight. And then a Division III National Conference Championship game. With a 13-7 win on the road over the New York Knockout in the first round of the playoffs, the 6-1 Maine Mayhem will now host the 6-1 Cincinnati Cougars, who had a strong 56-8 victory over the Virginia Panthers. The Mayhem are playing in their second straight conference championship game, and for the Cougars, it is their first. Alex, each side of the Division III bracket has a team that made the conference championship game last year and a team who is new to this game. What are your thoughts on the Division III conference championships? Brian, the big thing that I think about when I look at these games is that when you have conference championship games, typically you, you lend your way towards experience, and that doesn't necessarily favor Cincinnati here, but when you talk about what Maine has done in last season's games and here in this postseason so far, when you look at teams who are going to find success, it's a team that's on the home and a team that has momentum rolling, especially on offense. We've seen at Division Three for years and years and years that teams that have better offenses typically tend to do better. We saw it last year in the Division Three championship game when West Palm Beach came in and just blew everybody out of town with how powerful their offense was. I expect that here. You know, starting out West, you know, if I look at that, I want to give the advantage to Oklahoma just because, you know, their their margin of victory was a little bit better, and I think that they they seem to be doing things that are going in the right direction. For me, their schedule has been phenomenal as well this year, so I like Oklahoma on that side. Doesn't mean New Mexico can't win, but I'd say give me Oklahoma in that one. And then in the East, I want to say that I'd really like to see Maine pull out this victory with how much, how much change and how much they've put into this program. Same too for Cincinnati, though. I think that Cincinnati has a high-flying offense, the question just becomes, will it travel enough to put them on the short road to Kandahar? Huh? Now let's look at the Division II Conference Championships. After a 36-20 victory over the Detroit Venom, the 6-1 West Palm Beach Coyotes are looking to add a Division II National Conference Championship to their trophy case next to their Division III Championship from 2023. They will take this challenge on the road when they meet the 7-0 Atlanta Rage, who kept their undefeated season going by beating the Baltimore Nighthawks 27-12. Atlanta wants to avenge an opening round loss last season and had a great chance to do so, having outscored their opponents at home this year 136-26. And with a 30-8 win over the Derby City Dynamite, the 7-0 OKC Lady Force are back in the American Conference Championship game for the second straight season. They will host the 6-1 Nebraska Pride, who got here with a 70-0 win over the Austin Outlaws. This will be the second straight season that these two teams will meet for a chance to go to Canton. Last season it was OKC. Nebraska hopes that this year is their turn. Alex, these are the four highest scoring teams in Division II this season, averaging a collective 40.4 points per game. Which two teams have the defense to get their offense to camp? Well, that's for these two games, Ryan, that's that big question. Which team defensively is going to be stronger? I take a look at what's going to happen in the National Conference. And earlier on, when we recorded the quarterfinal show, I said that I like West Palm Beach because of the strength of their defense. The question for me in that contest is how well will it travel to Atlanta? Because Atlanta, again, a team that we saw success from at Division II a year ago. We saw again in success this time around and against pro opponents this season. I certainly like where Atlanta's headed, but I think that this West Palm Beach game is the toughest test that they have so far. I think that if you give the edge to Atlanta, it has to do largely with that home field advantage. That being said, again, West Palm Beach 
can win. And we talked about in our last segment as to why they have that offense that can put more points on the scoreboard than just about anybody. I think the one major difference here, though, is that where you have an Atlanta side that has not lost a contest, you have a West Palm Beach side that has and who they lost to I think is just as important as when they lost to them. So I give Atlanta the edge here in a game that on a neutral site to me would be a coin flip, but give Atlanta the home field advantage, give them the win here. When I look out west, you know, Nebraska, you look at that scoreline that they had against Austin and 70 to nothing, that's quite a, a gaudy scoreline. Uh, score but I also think too that, you know, Austin, is in Division Three or in WFA Pro. Austin's not a playoff team, and I think that they're kidding themselves if they don't agree with that statement as well. They were a team that was 1-5. They did not belong in the playoff picture, and they got blown out of the water because of that. When I look at how Nebraska would go down to OKC and play OKC, Nebraska's strength is their offense, but they started to get it a little bit on defense. The problem is this year, the defense for Nebraska didn't really get it against major opposition. Look at the game that they played against Minnesota at the WFA Pro level. Look at other games that they have played against top-tier opposition. Going down to an OKC team that largely has had its core in place, that largely has had the same players, that's looking to make its third straight trip to Canton, Ohio. When I look at those matchups and I look at those games, I have to give OKC the edge there. They have the experience, and more importantly, they have the success because it's one thing to have experience in these games, Brian, but you also have to have success in these games, especially for teams that are looking to be championship bound. The story has almost reached its end, or has it? For Lois Cook and her segment, Low on the Go. She works here too? You know, we got to get a discount. All right. Hi, you made it. It's so good to see you. Okay, so we're gonna do two of us. Mm -hmm. It will be $2.48. Put it on that card right there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh. <clears throat> it was declined. <clears throat> okay, um, well, we're going to do one. Just do one. Mm -hmm. we, okay, we'll just do. Oh. Oh, that's all right. Get this too. The doctor will see you. Ah! I'm gonna go out here. Wait, call me when you finish now. I think I'm gonna make it. Okay. I'm gonna make it. Keep going. Okay. <laughs> um. <sighs> I know we were in the office for a long time, but I did not expect her to die on me. I, I won't miss her so much. <laughs> in my office. When I tell you about aging on me like that, that's disrespectful. But for right now, I'm gonna need you to get it together because we got unfinished business to do. Thank you. You can't be decomposing on my sheets. Thank you so much for my job. You are the sweetest, the kindest woman ever. Train up. Me dead. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. I was just gone an hour. Just an hour. Oh, no. oh I need to get down. Come on. I can't believe it. Oh, we gotta bring her back to life. We gotta get her back to life. You 
Tanisha, you're going to get you in trouble. Now, you go on back over there. I was sleeping good. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Whew, back at this again. Do you think you can hold my hand? Hand. She done did it to me again. Dang it, go on. After this short break, we will look at the Pro Division American Conference Championship game. Welcome back. Let's look at the Pro Division American Conference Championship game. For the second straight season, the 7-0 St. Louis Slam will host the 5-2 Minnesota Vixen. St. Louis got to this game with a 28-6 win over the Cali War and Minnesota with a 35-13 win over the Mile High Blaze. Minnesota and St. Louis are no strangers to each other, with this being the eighth meeting in the last three seasons. In fact, Minnesota's combined five losses over the last two seasons have all been at the hands of the Slam. Alex, Minnesota has only ever beaten the Slam once in their 10 meetings, and that was in April of 2022. Since that time, the Slam have outscored Minnesota by a combined 99 points in the last nine meetings. I have been told that Minnesota is going with a different defensive package in this conference championship game. Will Minnesota get back to Canton, Ohio for the third time in four seasons, or is St. Louis going back to back? Well, I think the, the big thing I look at here, Brian, is that you have a Minnesota team that has had, since St. Louis refound their rhythm after not playing in 2021, not getting up to speed fully in 2022 until it was too late. You have this St. Louis Slam team that has continued to dominate you and continue to be, you know, little brother, big brother, whatever synonym you want to use. That's exactly what it's felt like. You know, and we've seen this game played out a number of times. We've seen it played out in a number of situations. Before we started recording this, I said to you, and I've had the, the opinion very, very clearly here, that if you look at just, if there was just one game played this year between these two teams, the conversation that we're having now is a lot different than what that conversation would be. Because when you have that game that started the season between these two, and my goodness, was it a classic. Holy cow, coming down to the wire, Minnesota roaring back, and then all of a sudden, a gutsy decision by first-year head coach Connor Joe Lewis to go for two, not to go for the tie, but to go for the win. And, you know, you look at how that game played out, high-scoring offense, defensively, both teams were poor, so they were giving up points by, at, the, at, at will, really. And you, you looked at that and you said, okay, well, maybe Minnesota has a chance here. Maybe they, are, they have the opportunity to go into St. Louis in June and knock them off down there. But then I watched the film from that game in St. Louis on the 15th. And then I watched, you know, what I saw to Minnesota and St. Louis last week in the playoff round. Minnesota's defense bent, but don't break. We saw that in, against Mile High, where that first drive of that game, Mile High was able to work their way slowly down the field. And the major turning point in that game between Mile High and Minnesota was the loss of the starting quarterback for the Blaze. That was the major turning point. Because Minnesota then... <clears throat> Minnesota could take anything else they wanted to with the rest of the game, and they could just run up and down the field on the mile-high blaze. We talked a lot about how offensively talented this team has always been, and the star has been the defense in the interior and in the linebacking core. The secondary has struggled. We saw Mile High try to attack that in the first quarter, but then with that quarterback injury, that was the end of that. Defensively, I'm curious to see what Minnesota has up their sleeve. Again, it's something where, you know, we, and we've talked about the, the offensive stars for the St. Louis Slam ad, ad nauseum here, where we've talked about Jamie Gall and her great strength since coming in as quarterback of the St. Louis Slam in 2019. We've talked about how Jada Humphrey has supplanted friend of the program, Taylor Hay, as that feature running back. We, they have great offensive passing receiving options, and then they have great defensive options. And the key thing for St. Louis, they stay healthy. You know, Taylor Hay hasn't played much of snap at all that I've seen this season for the St. Louis Slam. It's been Jada Humphrey's ship, so to speak. And she's been dominant. She's been able to maintain and it's earned her an All-American nomination. I think that when you look at this game, and viewers of Road to Kent will remember my long, passionate, fired-up speech from last year, where I charged Minnesota with the role that now is the time to go down to St. Louis and beat them and shut up the critics. I don't think that that can happen because of health.
because when you look at the roster for Minnesota and who they played against Mile High, there were too many key players that were out against Mile High. You look at specifically the defensive line, Britta Clark, Britta Clark not playing in that game. A massive loss, certainly. You look at Paige Kuplick on the offensive side of the football. As you talk about matching a round game in the mold of success of the Boston Renegades, having multiple runners, Sarah Roche is an All-American. Joanna Vermeulen is the All-American as well. But Kuplick was really that third piece in that offensive game. She didn't play against Mile High. And so I don't think, and again, as somebody who's been with the Minnesota Vixen for a long time, part of me hopes I'm wrong. But the realist in me says that Minnesota doesn't have a chance to win this game because St. Louis is too good at home. And in a year in which the St. Louis Slam defeated the Boston Renegades in their own house, I find that there's next to no way that Minnesota can go in and beat St. Louis in St. Louis because of what we saw in the regular season finale. It was a mismatched game. Yes, it was close at the beginning, but then if you give the slam a chance, they are always going to do what their offense does. And that is air, sea, ground, whatever. It will attack you and it will make you pay for your mistakes. And I expect St. Louis to do so again on Saturday and return to Canton, Ohio. We'll be right back to look at the National Conference Championship game. Welcome back. Let's look at the Pro Division National Conference Championship game. In a rematch of the 2022 National Conference Championship, the Pittsburgh Passion will play the Boston Renegades. The Passion got here by beating the Tampa Bay Inferno 41 to 13, and Boston by beating the DC Divas 27 to 20. The biggest difference this season is that it is not Boston with the undefeated record as they are 5-2. It is the Passion at 7-0 hosting this game. Alex, these two teams last met on June 8th with Pittsburgh giving Boston their second loss of the 2024 season. Will Boston return to the national championship for the seventh straight season? Or does Pittsburgh go for the first time since they joined the WFA? This is, you know, we... We talked week one, Brian, and we talked on ESPN2 last year about the, the big question of not who was going to beat the Boston Renegades, but who was going to come close. And now two teams have not come close, they've beaten them outright, both of which happening when Boston was on the road. This matchup is, you know, we, we talk about games of the week. This might be the game of the year, not just because of what could happen on the football field, but because of the implications of this game. I think when you look at that game back on June 8th, we had a lot of questions about what the backup quarterback McFadden's ability was going to be. We didn't see it, the ability in the first half of that contest. We saw it in the second half. And so now going into this contest a month later, the question becomes, and, and it's odd to have to ask this question, the question becomes, which Boston Renegades do we get? Do we get the first half Boston Renegades that struggled to move the ball well down the field? Not that they didn't move the ball, they did, but they moved, They struggled to move the ball well down the field. Do we get the Boston Renegades team that let Pittsburgh move the ball up and down and start to get some really solid points of play going on? Or do we get the second half Boston Renegades that surged in the back half, got the defensive stops that they needed, really were able to move the pace of play offensively on the side of the ball, and were able to make that game close. I don't know. I really don't. This is a position that Boston, Boston hasn't had to be in this position in quite some time, being on the road in a playoff game. But that's where that pedigree kicks in. Because when you have championship pedigree, you have the ability to win road, home, neutral site, wherever, because Boston knows that they can. And even though we don't know if Allison Cahill is available for, for this game, if at all, only Boston knows that, you still have to figure that Boston is a dangerous animal here simply because they're back into a corner. Because for the Boston Renegades, a successful season is a national championship and a blowout. Last year, for that first quarter against St. Louis, it wasn't a blowout. And so now all of a sudden here, where you look at what Boston has, failure in this game is inexcusable certainly for the Boston Renegades, especially with what we were talking about coming into the season for what they have. You know, you have Mata back, you have Katie Falkowski, you've missed Tutti Kusinen, but both starting to get some really good run of form here in the postseason. Go back to that game they played against DC. 
That was, you know, you talk about playing one team in week eight of the regular season and then playing them the first round of the playoffs. That did not look like two teams that were familiar with each other. It was a game that, to my, in my opinion, looked sloppy, that was ineffective, and really allowed the defenses to be the star of the show. It's a closer game, I think, that I've seen between Boston and D.C. in any point in time since I started working for the WFA. And you look at that and you say, okay, well, how does momentum ride into a postseason game on the road in Pittsburgh? We'll find out. I think when you look at the Pittsburgh passion as well, we, we talked about week one, Brian. They had to stay healthy. They also, like Boston, had some struggles in their playoff matchup against Tampa, getting the ball going early, where that game at the half was really considerably close. I think it was just a touchdown that separated the two teams. But then Pittsburgh did what they do, especially at the home, and they started to carry away and start really dominating the offense. I love, again, we talked about in the beginning of the season for Marcelina Chavez, her first year as the full-time starting quarterback of the Pittsburgh Passion, what was her capability going to be? And she's been phenomenal for the Pittsburgh Passion here this season. You look at what Pittsburgh has, and again, with how well they have played, granted, again, they had a second half slip up against Boston. They had a slow start in that game against Tampa in the opening round of the playoffs. It figures to be a good opportunity, if not the greatest opportunity, that the Pittsburgh Passion have had to advance to a league championship game in, in their franchise's history and definitely here in the WFA at the Pro Division. I, you know, I, I have my feeling for Minnesota-St. Louis. We talked about that last segment. But for this game, I really don't have a feel on it. Not because, you know, someone say, well, Alex, you're not prepared. You didn't watch the film. You didn't look up the stats, blah, 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 blah. No. I don't think that unless you're in the locker room of the Pittsburgh Passion or the Boston Renegades, you can look at this game and say conceivably that one team is more likely to win over the other. Because I think if you look at the Boston Renegades, you can claim them based solely on pedigree alone. You can claim them based on the offensive success that they had, especially in second halves this season. Or you can look at it where you can say, well, Pittsburgh's been dominant at home. The defense has been stellar. They already played a great game against Boston at home this season. That gives you the faith that they might be able to pull out a victory here. This is, in the time that I've covered the WFA, this is probably the one game, including all the Minnesota Vixen games that I've done. This is probably the one game that going into it, I don't genuinely know a result or think that I know a result, and that's the big thing there. I don't genuinely know what's going to happen, and I think for WFA fans, that's what makes this Boston-Pittsburgh game perhaps the most important game in league history, but also the most intriguing, and I can't wait to watch on Saturday. If you are familiar with Terry Lister, you know that he has the uncanny ability to predict scores like that of a Las Vegas sports book. I asked Terry his thoughts on the Pro Division Conference Championship games, and this is what he had to say. Terry Lister here, bringing you my predictions for the Pro Division Conference Championships. We got spoiled this year because we've seen both of these games already happen. St. Louis has played Minnesota twice, and Pittsburgh has also played Boston in the same venue that they'll be playing them in um, this weekend. So, first matchup, St. Louis, Minnesota was 41-40. St. Louis, great game. Minnesota pushed them to the edge. It was the first time Minnesota played, so St. Louis didn't have film on them. And so I was curious to see how the second matchup would be in St. Louis. Second matchup was 42-7. St. Louis whooped them. So my prediction for that game is 35-14 St. Louis because the last score was 42-7. It's going to be in St. Louis again. And I think I'm giving St. Louis one less touchdown and Minnesota one more touchdown because Minnesota should be emptying the, empty the tank. Now, could the final score be 49 or 56 to 0? Yeah, it could be because St. Louis is that good, uh, but we'll see how it plays out. Moving on to Pittsburgh and Boston. Pittsburgh beat Boston 26 21 earlier this season in Pittsburgh, which would be in Pittsburgh again. I watched that game. Pitt Pittsburgh went out to a big lead. Boston came back in the second half, got all the way inside the red zone, and I think they, they fall, fell a little bit short. So, the final was 26 21. Pittsburgh pulled off the upset. Now, I do not know if Marcelina Chavez is playing, and because of that, I have two different predictions. With Chavez, 36-21 Pittsburgh. Without Chavez, 27-21 Boston. Good luck to all four teams. Thanks. Next season, we plan on completely overhauling this show. We want your opinions on who we should have join our on-air staff, 
what kind of interviews and segments we should have, and most importantly, what the new name should be. Please send all this information to Alex and I at roadtocantonshow at gmail.com. Very soon, we're going to know who's going to make the trip to Canton, Ohio, and we can't wait to share that with you in two weeks' time. For Lois Cook and Alex Westhead, I'm Brian Sweeney, and we'll see you on the road to Canton. Thank you for watching the preceding presentation from the Women's Football Alliance.